Happy Friday. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Fortify. The gang is all here. Maddie, Eric, and Lauren. Our table is back. Hi, Eric is back. It is a good Friday. The old friend is back here. Yeah, we've got a lot planned for you. Don't forget to join us on WFMY News 2's Facebook page. We'll chat with you there during the breaks. Yeah, come and chat with us because we got some big news. It is official that coach John Shire will be the new head men's basketball coach at Duke University. Yes, current coach Mike Krzyzewski is retiring after the next season. And earlier today, coach Shire spoke about his new role. WFMY News 2's Luke Lydon is still live in Durham with more. Yes, today we had a little glimpse into the future for what Duke basketball fans can expect after Coach K retires after this upcoming 2021 season. The program introduced their next head coach and John Shire, the 20th in program history. And I'll tell you one thing, he certainly convinced me that he is the right man for the job. At his press conference earlier today here inside Cameron Endor Stadium, he spoke with conviction, confidence, and also a level of self-awareness, knowing no one can replicate what Mike Krzyzewski has done with this Duke program. But keep in mind, Shire isn't a stranger to the triangle as he played for the Blue Devils, helping win a national title back in 2010. This before joining Krzyzewski's staff in 2013. And now Shire is ready for the biggest opportunity of his life. I do not expect this to be easy. I don't expect it to be easy. I don't expect to be given anything. We do not expect to be given anything but I'm always going to show up, always going to show up and, and do whatever it takes to succeed at the highest level here and with the standard that's been set at Duke. Now his age might scare some Duke fans as Coach K's successor because he is just 31 years old, but this is a little ironic here. When Coach K first took over the program back in 1980, guess how old he was? Also 33 years old, and look how his career ended up. I know one game, one year at a time, especially for Shire, he has to prove himself, but he thinks uh, he is the right man for the job, and so do his former players and former teammates that played on Shire's uh, team or uh, back in 2010. We'll hear from them coming up at 5 and 6 o'clock, so be sure to join me then. All right, thanks, Luke. And as we mentioned, Coach K will be leaving at the end of next season. During a press conference yesterday, he told fans that the decision to move was not about his personal health or the state of college basketball. Instead, he says it's a choice he and his wife made together. The reason we're doing this is because Mickey and I have decided the journey is going to be over in a year. and we're going to go after it as hard as we possibly can. Coach K joined the Blue Devils as head coach back in 1980 and has since led the team to five national championships and 12 Final Fours. Let's take a look at the headlines this afternoon with your four to five roundup. Former Wake Forest basketball head coach Dino Gaudio pled guilty to a federal charge of attempted extortion in connection to his time as University of Louisville basketball assistant. Gaudio was dismissed from the team along with another assistant back in March after the Cardinals missed the NCAA tournament. Federal prosecutors say Gaudio threatened to go to the media with alleged NCAA violations by the team. The guilty plea was to a charge of interstate communication with intent to extort. Gaudio's plea deal includes probation and a fine. The North Carolina House once again approved legislation that would allow people to concealed carry handguns at churches that meet on private school campuses. The bill is a push by gun rights advocates to bring these religious venues on par with standalone places of worship. Now, critics of the bill say that more gun access does not help prevent violence. The measure now returns to the Senate, which passed a version of this bill back in March. And newly released jobs numbers show the economy added 559,000 jobs in May as the country slowly continues to recover from the pandemic. Unemployment fell slightly to 5.8 percent, but this report was much better than April's dismal showing. It still fell short of expectations. Employment in the leisure and hospitality sector made gains as pandemic-related pandemic, me related restrictions continue to ease, but as the modest gains point to a widespread labor shortage. Now at four, reports show one in four Americans struggle with mental health and 80% of Americans will experience some form of mental illness in their lifetime. But despite the numbers, leaders at Mental Health Greensboro say there is still a stigma associated with the chronic disease. That's why they're putting on a drive-through concert with a goal to stomp the stigma. 
No, 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 we can do that here. Do you prefer mornings or afternoons? Jennifer Keating volunteers at Mental Health Greensboro. The nonprofit provides free peer support services to the community. Okay. But before acting as a volunteer, Keating found herself grappling with a crisis of her own. Past trauma, and I already have a chronic illness. Um, and so I found myself falling in a spiral downhill, and it seemed like I just, I was just really struggling. In 2017, she began participating in recovery and support and educational programs at Mental Health Greensboro. Now, four years later, she is a state certified peer support specialist, assisting others coping with traumatic experiences. They helped me rebuild my self-esteem, uh, gave me courage. I'm now answering phones and volunteering. I'm out in the community. The organization helps roughly 4,000 people like Keating each year. Executive Director Donna Shelton says there's a lack of understanding when it comes to mental health. It's a chronic condition that can be managed just like any other chronic condition, and it can be treated. That's why the group is hosting the Stop the Stigma drive through concert at the Greensboro Coliseum. Money raised from the event will go back into the organization's programs. We want to reach the community and get people to really start to understand that there is a stigma attached to mental health issues and that they have to stomp it. They have to get rid of it and deal with it and face it. The concert is happening June 12th and tickets are $50 per vehicle. Now there will be raffle tickets for paintings and some other goodies. We'll post all the details on the performances on our website, WFNYNews2.com. I'm so happy to uh, hear them talking about this and I love what the executive director says that there's a lack of understanding when it comes to mental health that it is a chronic condition. I'll also just say I think that there's a misunderstanding when it comes to mental health. So I like that this concert is highlighting that there is a stigma around it because as soon as we can identify those stigmas, we can get rid of them. Absolutely. Because it's long standing too, Maddie. I mean, I think about this, especially when, when I was a kid. I had panic attacks as a kid. It was no, it was no joke and it took me a while to, to get a hold of it but people didn't talk about things like they do now and it's mm -hmm. so good that we're breaking that down now there still is i will have to say you're you're right there's still a stigma with it it's not as strong as it used to be but this is the beginning of breaking down that wall it's great we are having this conversation this is the second year they're doing the concert but last year it was virtual and they were able to reach about 24,000 people in guilford county so hopefully this year People come on out for the concert, and we have those details on our website if you're interested. Yeah, and in order to get people the help that they truly need, they need to be comfortable coming forward and saying, look, I'm, I'm struggling with a few things, and I want to talk about them without having the fear of judgment. So, again, Lauren, thanks for highlighting the story. Anytime we can talk about this yes. on TV and just make it seem normal, it's great. Because yeah. it good. is normal. Yes. It absolutely is. All right, let's talk about our forecast real quick. Uh, yeah, things are heating up. Well, I'll tell you one thing. If nothing else, we're just consistent with our forecast. And when I say that I'm talking about temperatures and I mean high temperatures, we're not going to change a whole lot. What you see is what you get within three or four degrees for almost a week as we see just a typical summertime pattern kind of lock in on us. But I don't know about you, I'll take that. I like the consistency here, not a lot of surprises. Uh, most of the temperatures that we're seeing now, anywhere from about 82 up to 86, and that's across central North Carolina. Of course, cooler in the upper 70s and low 80s for the mountains uh, and the higher elevations. But overnight lows tonight, going down to 64, will be partly cloudy. Um, it will be a little muggy, not quite as bad, but still muggy. 86 tomorrow, scattered clouds. That's fairly warm, a little bit above normal for us, but we'll take it. And again, it is that typical summertime pattern. Do we see a couple of pop-up showers? Yes, we do today. May not see as much of that over the next few days, but you think about a normal pattern, what comes to mind and for a North Carolina forecast, you know what it is. It's just sunshine, then a few clouds by afternoon and evening, 20 to 30% chance of a late day pop-up shower or storm, and that's exactly what we see in our seven day. We'll be at 86 for your Saturday. It's a beautiful weekend, a little warm on Sunday at 88, but then we're locked in at 86 to 87. That is the range of high temperatures, if you wanna call that a range. From Monday through Friday of next week, rain chances hold at about a 20%, again, all afternoon and evening pop-ups. That'll be Saturday, Sunday, 30% for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and 30 on Thursday. We'll bump it up a smidge for the end of next week with a 40% chance of late day storms. We're coming back.
Everything's back again. Check, check, check. Hi. Next weekend. What is next weekend? It's a Lexington Music Festival next oh. weekend. That's what we'll be talking about in just a minute. I saw something about Lexington the other day. Now I can't remember what it is, but it was cool. Yeah, this is like their first big <laughs> gathering event. Giving you a lot of information. I saw something about Lexington. It was cool. I don't remember what it was. <laughs> don't know what it was. I know. I know the barbecue festival is back this year. Yes. Woohoo. I do love barbecue. Ooh, yes. Have you tried city barbecue? Yes. It's good. Very Where, good. Where's that at? It's uh, on Lawndale Target. in the Target shopping center. Like. I was about to tell Lauren what it used to be, but the that would be shake. nothing to her. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, Lawndale where Target and um, PetSmart are located in Greensboro. That's and it's in the foreground, like right close to the road. Right where really Lawndale and Battleground split. I don't Core Life. Okay, keep driving past okay. Core Life, and the Target is on. The I'll lap. have to check it out. Central was a city, city barbecue. City, city. The Central ribs, barbecue. Was the brisket and ribs. It's good. City barbecue. We have talked about it extensively over the past 15 months, and that would be when will we get live concerts in person back again? Well, in Lexington, the answer is next weekend. I spoke with city manager Tara Green about their Depot District Music Fest. Tara, thanks for being with us today. So, you know, thank goodness we're getting these things back now. Uh, talk a little bit about your thought process of bringing this festival back now. Absolutely. We had planned this actually in 2020 and we were going to do a census celebration. We had mobilized for the census and so we were doing different genres. Um, but that got canceled so we carried over some of these bands into 2021. So we're really excited it's back. Now, will it look different than it was pre-pandemic and how are things shaping up for you? It will look different. We're daring to be a little different this year in terms of blending multiple genres together. This is a little bit of an eclectic festival and it was built around bringing a common theme of stringed instruments, but different genres to have crossover appeal to varying audiences. It's also 12 and under are free and so it's very family friendly. It's outdoors. It's a safe event. So this will be, I mean, really the first big outdoor music event for Lexington in a while because of everything. Is uh, excitement building, do you think? What are you hearing? Excitement is really building. In fact, two of these four artists, this is their first live performance since before the pandemic. So they are going to be pumped and excited, and I'm hoping they're going to play for a huge crowd. Um, we've got Black Violin, who is nominated for a Grammy. Um, they are classically trained, and but do hip-hop crossover duo. They are unbelievable, and they have real affection for the arts and educational outreach. So youth are welcome. Well, Terry, everybody's excited. Thank you so much for taking time out today. Best of luck on the event. I'm just excited that, yes, you can gather together and watch a concert. <laughs> People are going to be beside themselves. I love this idea of mixing the different genres within string with hip hop crossover, all that. I think they're definitely going to get a lot more people that are want to come out this year than probably years past since they can uh, spread to so many types of music people like. I don't know who in Lexington, maybe it's Tara, is in charge of booking these acts, but they have a history and a reputation of booking great performers, not yes. just for Depot District concerts and uh, things that they happen outside of the barbecue festival, the barbecue festival as well. I remember years ago, I saw Taylor Swift there before she was Taylor Swift. She really? was just this blonde country singer who was performing at the barbecue festival. Yes, I want to say it was like 2008, but don't quote me on wow. that. But she was like not big time yet That's funny. before she so even she was really young then. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, was that, so she was a country. That was before yes, crossover. So yeah. you go to Lexington, you see these performers, and then years later, they're famous. Well, they had about five years ago, they had Darius Rucker there, and the crowd was just, they were yes, huge. Yes, I remember that year. Huge. So whoever yeah, yeah. does that, you're doing a great job. Stephanie St. Cyn, I do believe, <laughs> is who's doing that. All right, we're going to take a short break. We're coming back. Talk to us on Facebook. We are there.
physical fear. It's something everyone experiences as a kid, and it's no different for kids today, no matter how much you try to protect them. So today, Coach Lamont shares tips that we can use to speak to our children and destroy fear that they might be feeling in today's U Day moment. Many of you have children who are dealing with fear and anxiety. Recent events in our nation have left them feeling unsettled and unsure about the future. Now as parents, our job is to infuse hope into their hearts. This can be difficult, especially when in secret, we're feeling the same instability. But there are a few things that we can do to help them and help ourselves at the same time. Number one, create a consistent, safe environment in our home. Number two, allow them to share their fears without you being dismissive. Sometimes they just need to be heard. Have honest, age-appropriate dialogue and give them a perspective of hope. Refrain from sharing negative viewpoints that they cannot properly process. Instead, focus on the importance of love and gratitude. And lastly, have dinner as a family and talk about the future in a positive light. This will teach them to focus on brighter days which are to come. This is Coach Lamont reminding you to have your best you day. I'll see you tomorrow. I love that last one. Have dinner as a family. You know, my family was on the road a lot because we would drive 45 minutes to cheer practice almost every night. But we had to have dinner together, even if it was Chick-fil-A on the drive home. And we just got to talk about all kinds of things. I think that's so important. Absolutely. That's something me and my family did as well. We always ate dinner at the kitchen table. But I like what Coach Lamont was saying. It's just important that we check in with our children, ask them questions like, how was your day today? How are you feeling? And let them know it's okay if they are scared or nervous or anything like that. Good advice as always. All right. Eric Chilton hasn't worked in a while, so let's Let's yeah. talk to him. <laughs> I'm making up for lost time, Gardner. That's what's happened. I'm getting ready to go on a stretch here. Took some days off, and you know what? If you have any days off coming up in the next seven days, then basically you're going to see a typical North Carolina summertime pattern. We don't have many surprises in the forecast, and as we said at the top of the show, that's a good thing in my book. We're looking at low to mid 80s for just about everybody. If you, um, I'd say that range probably 82 to about 86 degrees for right now. Obviously, this is the time of day when we usually get close to that high temperature, so what you see may be very close to what we have for the uh, end result today. 64, the low tonight, partly cloudy, still scattered clouds tomorrow. Uh, it starts to get a little warm by Sunday, but for tomorrow, we'll go with a high of 86. Sunday, I think we'll get close to 90, about 88 degrees. If you look at the satellite and radar, there goes the cold front that moved by the other day. Uh, hung around for a little bit, didn't it? It was for a day or two. Now that's out of here. High pressure moves in and that will keep us dry, mostly dry. Now we'll keep a slight rain chance in, maybe about a 20% and that's a just in case really. I don't expect a whole lot in the way of moisture for your weekend. We'll go with partly cloudy skies. That's Saturday and Sunday. Highs go 86 and 88 those two days. There's the 20%, so that's not a lot. Normal is 30 to 40 for us. We get that every afternoon, Monday through Friday of next week. Highs between 86 and 87.
Well, it's time to top off your positivity tank heading into the weekend. Even in tough times, there's a lot of good happening around us. We just have to look a little harder. WFMY News 2's Megan Malaris makes it her mission each week to find what's bringing joy to you. Heading into the weekend, we could all use a few moments of reflection. So it's time to sit back, relax, and just reflect on life's many blessings. I asked you on my Facebook page, Mega Malaris News, to tell me something good, big or small, that happened in your life recently. Jennifer's five-year-old daughter Hannah sang this little light of mine at church Sunday all by herself. Patsy's granddaughter Peyton graduated from UNC last month and started her new job. Melissa's fiance celebrated his 50th birthday May 29th. Anna's great niece graduated kindergarten from Next Generation Academy. Robin's husband has a terminal illness but has been stable several months. Despite all odds, he celebrated birthday number 66 and had a surprise Route 66 themed party. Mamie had a sleepover with all five grandchildren this past weekend. Wanda's husband vacuumed the whole house in one day and it looks great. Catherine got news there's going to be a new baby in the family in late December or early January. Alicia's three children got their first COVID vaccines and she's so proud of them. On Memorial Day, Brenda and her husband had breakfast at a local restaurant. A gentleman came to their table and thanked her husband for his service, then paid for their meal. Our assistant news director Michael found this little fawn at his house. Mama dear came back not long afterward. Sharon met some of her half sisters she didn't know existed. And after a three year wait, Cheryl's family got finalization on the adoption of her granddaughter. Lots of good stuff. Yeah, those are some of the best stories we've heard in a while would tell me something good. I especially like that Wanda's husband vacuumed the house. No, so that's the one I was laughing at because I said, It's so good. Man, I wish my wife would be happy about me just vacuuming. Uh, if <laughs> someone vacuumed my house, I would be over the moon. That, I don't think my dad ever vacuumed right? growing up, <laughs> ever. See, it's little things. Just do little things for the people you love. We had five kids in my family growing up. I'm the youngest of five, and I guarantee you my dad never changed a diaper. Guarantee. What? Yes. My mom we'll jokes about that. He at school. least threw out the trash, though. Oh, he the, did all that stuff. Yeah, 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 but he okay. wouldn't do And I remember when, when I had the twins and I was changing diaper, he walked in and started laughing. I'm like, what? <laughs> he said, you're, you're doing a good job. I said, yeah, Dad, it's, you know, it's... It's now. It's not back when you grew up. <laughs> Double duty. That's Double right. duty duty. Yeah. That's, right. that's I mean. exactly right. <laughs> so true. So true. So vacuum for someone you love this weekend or, or change an extra change diaper. Change an extra too. diaper. That, go, that goes farther than vacuum. Long way. Yeah. We're coming right back. It's 4 26 right now. The other stories were great too. Oh, yeah. They were they all were. good. They were they were all the good. graduations, all that. <laughs> Yeah, what the heck, Callie? Hi there. Uh, uh, what am I doing here? Oklahoma, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas. Wait, is West Virginia still a state?
Well, happy Friday, everyone, and welcome back to your 4 to 5. I'm Lauren Coleman here with Eric Chilton and Maddie Gartner. That's redundant, isn't it? Happy Friday, that's redundant. Fridays are always happy. <laughs> that's true. Always happy. <laughs> Chad Silber agrees with me over somewhere over there. He's behind the camera. You that's can't see him, but you will. And if you <laughs> stick around long enough, we may be able to convince Chad to talk to uh, everyone on Facebook during the break. Chad, he okay, says. Okay, I am easily convinced to do things. He agrees. When I ask, that's what it is. Yeah. Move along. <laughs> All right, we'll check in with Chad in a little bit, but let's get to some of your headlines with your four to five roundup. Former President Donald Trump will make one of his first major public appearances since leaving office this weekend, right here in North Carolina. That state, the state's Republican Party says he is headlining their convention in Greenville. Other speakers include South Dakota Governor Christy Nome, Congressman Ted Budd, and Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson. The convention ends June 6. And Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is apologizing to Indigenous Canadians after the remains of more than 200 Indigenous children were found last week. Some were as young as three. The remains were discovered in Kamloops, British Columbia, at what was once Canada's largest residential school for Indigenous children. Many from Indigenous communities gathered this week to honor the lives lost. And racing at Bowman Gray Stadium in Winston-Salem will start tomorrow after Governor Roy Cooper lifted most COVID-19 restrictions. Drivers gathered at the track today to practice. The track posted on Facebook that there are plenty of general admission tickets available for purchase at the ticket gates. Races start tomorrow night at 8. Happy Friday, y'all. We hit a record low in one of our state's coronavirus metrics today. This graph shows the percentage of tests coming back positive. The latest number, 2.5%. It's the lowest number the state has reported since it started sharing this number on April 1st of last year. That was 14 months ago. It's continuing a recent trend where we have stayed in the 2 to 3% range, which is really good. In fact, we haven't even gone above the state's goal of 5%, that red line there, in 24 days. Well, the CDC is releasing a new troubling report on adolescents and COVID-19 that's expected to prompt an even bigger focus on getting young people vaccinated. It shows the number of adolescents hospitalized with the virus rose last month and nearly one third required intensive care. Dr. Karen Landers is the Alabama Assistant State Health Officer. She says misinformation on the vaccine is driving hesitancy, particularly among young people. We are concerned that even if we get through this summer with relatively low rates, that we could see an increase in the fall. President Joe Biden remains focused on states with the lowest vaccination rates in his push to get 70% of Americans at least partially vaccinated by July 4th. Health officials say efforts to reach more Americans younger than 18, as well as others in underserved communities, will be the key in ending the pandemic. President Biden says the U.S. will donate 25 million doses of surplus vaccines to United Nations in use of countries that need it badly. The move comes amid a big push to get more people vaccinated, especially in states with low vaccine rates. Dr. Sarah Nafziger is the vice president of clinical support services for the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Unfortunately, going from seeing crowded parking lots with va mass vaccine sites to empty parking lots. How does that even happen? What, what's the hesitancy here? You know, I, I wish I knew the answer to that question. People have a lot of questions about the safety and uh, there are some people who just, you know, I, I think will not be convinced. We saw similar issues at the FEMA site at the Four Seasons Town Center in Greensboro before it closed. In all, nearly 144,000 doses were given. Demand was high to start, but slowed as the weeks went on. On the last day, around 750 people were vaccinated, including high school students. Every year, the Volunteer Center puts on the Human Race. It's a 5K that allows you to raise money for the organization of your choice. Well, for the last 11 years, Haynes Inman Education Center has not only participated, but has been the largest fundraiser. I mean, we are all in. Once once January hits, the only thing we think over here is human race, human race, human race. <laughs> well, that is Mike Gibb. He is a vocational teacher at the school. Since the race is virtual this year, he created a track around the school so that everyone could complete the 5K together. But take a look. This was no ordinary route. Gibb had activities all around, including bowling, water balloons, and a kid's car wash 
Principal Kevin Carr says the human race brought his students together more than ever this year. One of the biggest disabilities we have is, is, is fighting isolation. And so one of the jobs at Haynes Inman is make the world a bigger place actually for all of us. And we love the, the human race event because it, 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 it makes us part of the larger community and it makes the world bigger not only for our kids, but for everybody else that participates in that. So Haynes Inman is a school for kids ages 3 to 22 with significant disabilities. And this year, the money that they raise for the human race is going to be used to purchase technology that can help them learn in the classroom and communicate with each other. If you're interested in donating to their human race team for the 5K, you can find that link on our website, WFMYNews2.com. I think they're going to be the highest fundraisers again already with $22,000. Wow. That, you know, if you're not familiar with the Volunteer Center, you know, even just take the human race out, you, the work they do is incredible. And you need to check them out, look at their website and read what they do overall. They honestly are kind of the engine that keeps the community running. I love this event because it's so interactive, you know, virtual, you know, running on your own might not be as fun, but this is a fun way to just bring everybody out, hold everybody accountable mm -hmm. as well. And they have 100% participation because yeah. all the kids were at school and in years past, they'd have to go on a particular Saturday oh. to the Greensboro Coliseum and, and go through the, the actual 5K route, which they loved. But this year, they got to have some fun while they were doing it. I don't know if y'all saw the, the kid car wash. They essentially <laughs> just uh, wheeled or walked the students through water, uh, falls, and then they like blew them off at the end. Oh, so it was like a, a so fun little simulation yeah, of you going through a car wash. I would like to do that myself. It's worth Especially it for that alone. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's how I want to run every 5K. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Gibbs, if you can make that happen, that'd be great. That would be phenomenal. All right, let's talk about our forecast, shall we? Because it's hot. I wish I had the car wash here. You're sweating it out in the weather garden. I can tell you that. And then we're going to be doing this for a while, folks. So get used to about mm, 86 to 89 degrees. That's kind of where we're going to be for almost an entire week, it looks like, so far. Uh, no surprises in the forecast. You can see pretty clear. We did have a couple of pop-up showers, but this anytime it's mid to upper 80s, you know we're going to have just an isolated shower, even if there's no front moving by. Um, this front moving off the coast, that one hung out for a little bit, but now we dry out a bit for the weekend. We still have to keep a slight rain chance in just because of the temperature being so warm and the, we get that lift in the atmosphere when we get in, into the 80s and there's a chance of a pop-up shower or storm, but reduced coverage, I think, for Saturday and Sunday. We'll bring those chances to about a 20%. Uh, and we'll bring it up to a more normal 30 to 40, and that's for every other day in the seven day forecast. So a good chance that muggy conditions will return, even though this high pressure keeps us pretty clear, I think, for your weekend. Saturday and Sunday, we'll say partly cloudy both days. We could see that stationary front linger a little bit and move back up to the north. Help with our rain chances, but again, you've got that standard 30 to 40 percent chance every day next week. Here's the forecast for tonight. Overnight lows at 64 degrees. It'll be a little bit less muggy, but still uh, this weekend, I think this weekend looks perfect. And then after that, we get back to a more normal summertime pattern. So reduced rain chances, as we mentioned. Tomorrow's high is 86, just with scattered clouds and getting warm. Sunday, hottest day of the week, 88, which means probably we'll see a, a low 90 in the southern Piedmont. And for every day next week, talk about consistency. 86 or 87 for the highs, lows in the upper 60s, and we've got that 30% chance to a 40% of a late day pop-up shower or storm every day for next week. We have some really great news to share this afternoon. An update nearly two weeks after former Carolina Panther Greg Olson announced his son may need a new heart. They found a match in tweets shared early this morning. Olson admitted there were mixed emotions as he and his wife walked his son TJ in for surgery and asked everyone for prayers for their son and his team of doctors and nurses. TJ was born with a congenital heart disease, which has largely spurred the Olson family's involvement with heart disease nonprofits and with helping launch the opening of a pediatric heart center at Levine Children's Hospital in Charlotte. TJ has had three open heart surgeries and lived with a modified heart for his entire life. He is eight years old. And another great moment to share tonight, Albert Jeffries, better known as Al J, will graduate high school. Five years ago, the Burlington teen received a life-saving heart transplant. Al J plans to head to Guilford Technical Community College and then transfer. His goal is to become a video game designer, and Aljay's heart has shown no signs of rejection in the five years since his transplant. That's an amazing surgery to me when you think about what doctors can do and also the 
I, I, would, I think it'd be horrible to be on that list and mm. wait and wait right. and not know. And the, but then when you get that phone call, that's life changing. We've been following Al J and his mom for quite some time now. Um, and when they got the heart transplant, I remember his donor was a young lady named Caitlin. And in this update about him graduating, our reporter uh, Grace did the story and she was talking about how he wears her name on a oh. dog oh, tag wow. right wow. over his heart. So when he graduated, he had Caitlin oh on God. his chest yeah. and inside with, with his heart. It's it's an amazing story. That's beautiful. I love stories like this and it really just stresses the need for donors that more people should try to be organ donors because they do wait months, sometimes even years, years. on these lists. Yeah, and it is something, I mean, it's just as simple as filling out, right? Mm -hmm. Just saying, I'm going to do this. I remember when I made that decision and I remember talking to, because uh, my kids asked me about it. They said, mm -hmm. are you an or organ donor? And I showed them that I was mm. and, and they said, why did you do it? And I'm like, Th these stories. Right. You know, I mean, you just point them to these stories. That's all you have to do. You absolutely can. And there are a lot of misconceptions out there about organ donation, but so many resources to clear any misinformation yes. up. If you're worried about that or considering it, maybe you're on the fence. I, I definitely recommend that you check that out. Yep, I would too. Mm -hmm. No reason not to. All right, we're going to take a short break. We're coming right back. Come chat with us on Facebook. It's the yeah. it's the Friday party. It is. We're dancing. We're singing. <laughs> Lauren singing. Lauren is singing <laughs> and dancing. I got gotcha. you. Facebookers. Oh no, I was talking to Leslie, who's running cameras out here. But I can talk. We only have one minute. What can we say in one Charlotte, minute? Charlotte, I don't know if I'm having allergy problems. I don't know if y'all can tell, but my voice is like a little <coughs> raspier than usual. Um, Did she pick that up? No, she, she was it? just asking oh. if anyone. I don't. I've never had allergies before, but I'm wondering if I have like delayed onset allergies. This it can season. happen. It can I, happen. I've had two times in my life of having yeah. allergies, but it just popped up for whatever reason. Um, but I've, I have a little tickle in my throat, and yeah, I know Callie. We have someone else in the building with with a similar situation going on. So we wonder if we have allergies. Oh, really? So Brad says he got allergies when he was in his 30s. Well, maybe I'm just getting old and <laughs> ill. Oh yeah, you're real old. Yes, I did call you yeah. on. <laughs> Well, food waste in the United States is on the rise, with Americans tossing out about 150,000 tons every day. That's about a pound of food per person. That's wild. As CBS News' Ian Lee reports, one country is making people pay for what they waste. Hmm. It's lunchtime in Seoul, and they're serving up quite a spread. South Korean meals typically have free and unlimited side dishes. And when diners don't finish their food, it goes to waste. But instead of chucking the leftovers in the trash, restaurant owners are required by law to separate food waste for recycling. It's the same at home. Residents pay for every pound of food they toss. 
either in a prepaid bag or at a machine that weighs the waste. In the summer, it smells bad, this garbage man says. It was that stench of rotting food from landfills that mobilized South Koreans to make a change. Activist Kim Miwa says intense protests forced the government to turn a nation of food wasters into food recyclers. Three decades later, more than 95 percent of food waste is recycled, becoming compost, biofuel, and at this factory, it's dried and turned into chicken feed. South Korea's system isn't perfect, though. There's still a lot of food waste to recycle, and processing plants are struggling to make a profit as most provide their services for free. But many residents say as long as that smell stays away, they're happy to continue to pay. Ian Lee, CBS News. Ooh, I'm so conflicted because the food looks so good, but then you're talking about the smell and it's in my nostrils right now. But <laughs> All three of us. <laughs> I don't know about that. Okay, um, but rotting food is a major problem yes, for the it environment. Is. It produces nearly 7% of all greenhouse wow. gas gases, greenhouse gases worldwide. A lot. You know, okay. when I was in college, we had someone who cooked for the house I lived in and someone on campus started a program where they would come get the leftover food and it wasn't trash, like none of us had touched it, right. but it was already prepared food and they'd box it up and take it to people oh, who were hungry. Great. So I feel like there have to be other programs like that after out there. It should be. I mean, and I, I do appreciate the fact that they're taking it and using it, their compost mm -hmm. or chicken feed, whatever it is. That's a good thing. My wife is obsessed with not wasting food. She will eat things longer than I would that have been in the fridge because she's like, we can't let that go to waste. I'm like, well, I'm not eating that after three days. <laughs> you got that less. I need to be like her because there's so many times where I buy all these groceries and I think I'm going to eat them and they just sit there. It's I true. saw a meme the other day that was like, congratulations to the people who actually finish the spinach that they buy at the grocery store because have y'all ever finished yeah, I tossed a out thing of two spinach? packages of spinach last night. I promise yeah. you. No one I was like, I'm going to scramble it. these for breakfast. Yeah, I'm you gonna, did it. And I didn't. And they just sat there. I was <laughs> like, oh, I don't I feel like eating that today. <laughs> uh, I'll do it tomorrow. It's hard uh, for and one person. It's yeah, hard to, it to It's always the spinach, though. <laughs> That's a good one. I love spinach. Bring it to me. I'll take it's care old. Of it. You'll eat it a couple days after the All right. No, I won't. You heard it here. What about a week after? That's what mine was at. And it's not as crisp. It's true. Sorry, we digress. We'll be right back. Stay there. <laughs> All right. Soggy spinach for Chilton.
Okay, we know that there seems to be a national day for everything. Today is no different. It's National Donut Day. Mm. Yeah. Happy Love about it. that. All right, lots of different ways that you can celebrate, too. There absolutely are. Well, Winston-Salem based Krispy Kreme is offering a double dose of deep fried dough. Vaccinated customers can take home two free donuts. Dunkin' is giving out a free classic donut with any beverage purchase today, too. And if a dad in your life prefers store-bought donuts, you can enter him into Intimate's Inti Man of Year contest <laughs> for a chance to win a free year supply. Is that a coffee cake donut? That looks, looks good. good. Well, take a look at this. It's not delivery. It's a donut. DiGiorno mm -hmm. is creating a dinner meets dessert mashup with the rollout of the DiGiornut. I didn't know <laughs> it was called that until DiGiorno. that moment. Uh, the DiGiornut, it's a pizza donut, and it made its debut today on National Donut Day. But you can't just go out and buy it at your local grocery store. DiGiorno is giving away a half dozen boxes to 10 winners through a Twitter contest. I'd eat that. that I would too. I would too. All right. So I asked you on Facebook, what's your favorite kind of donut? Carrie said glazed all the way. Easy as that. Don said lemon and Bavarian cream. Both good choices. Deborah Price Oakley says Mama Crockett cinnamon sugar donuts. I haven't had that. Emily McCoy says Glaze King donuts in Ashboro. Mm. Best apple fritter ever. William says I like two kinds, any and all. <laughs> Fran says Brits at Carolina Beach. And I have been told that for years and I still haven't gone. Uh, Karen says the best donut is the one in my hand. <laughs> okay, right, so Karen. I'm going to Carolina Curie Beach uh, tomorrow, to go and to my Brits. goal is to stand in line at Brits. I know that there's always a line, but that, I want to try it. Tanya Rivera swears by this, and I still haven't been yet. So another thing to put on my list. Mine too now. <laughs> I've also heard great things about Mama Crockett's. I know someone mentioned that. People line up. She has like a little food truck. She'll park at places. That's what it is. Yeah. Because I had, there were about five comments on that. On in that the, one? In the list. I yeah. think they're apple cider ones, I think. But they look great. And you mentioned Brits. I, they're only seasonal, right? They're only open. They're only open, yeah, like during the peak months. Oh, that's so interesting. So I hope that they're open oh, now. Oh, they're open now. This um, is peak. Born and raised on Krispy Kreme, though, growing up here in the triad. And <laughs> the wedding I was at on Saturday, Sunday, they gave out Krispy Kreme donuts on the way out. Uh. I took two. <laughs> Sorry. Nothing's wrong with that. Nothing Sorry, wrong with Alana and Tyler. That? I took two donuts. See, there's, it, it's a mental thing. If you get to three, then, then people you might don't have look a problem. You. Right. But I won't judge you it's if for you get someone to three else. or four. <laughs> but I love Krispy Kreme. I love a plain glazed I donut. Do that is my favorite. But I do like the occasional pumpkin spice Ooh, when mm -hmm, that's in mm -hmm. season. I love that too. Duck donuts. Don't forget that. I do like they are those. Awesome. I love donuts. All right. We should go get some donuts. Actually, after all this? Yeah. Yes. We deserve it. We deserve the donuts, <laughs> folks. <laughs> Don't start crying. <laughs> I want a donut. All right, let's take a look at the forecast, see what's happening there. It is, uh, oh, we could say hot and now, just like the donuts, ah! right? Hey, there you go. I've done this a time or two. Let's see what's going on with uh, the radar. Uh, most of the rain now down east, it's hovering along the coastal sections. That was the front that was really annoying us for a while, wasn't it? Just hanging out, not going anywhere. Um, all that rain will continue moving on to the east. We see a high pressure moving into place. That will make us, uh, I'm not going to say totally dry because you can't rule out a shower when we're as warm as we are. Late day pop up, shower or storm, but it's only a 20% for Saturday and Sunday. Those chances will go back up though as we head into next week. 64 will be the overnight low tonight. Partly cloudy, a little less muggy. We'll take that. Tomorrow, this is a great weekend by the way. 86 scattered clouds. We go up to 88 on Sunday, so we will see a 90 probably in the southern Piedmont. Watch for that. Overnight lows mid 60s through your weekend, and then we're back to a normal summertime fair. Average high is 82, so we're a little above normal, four or five degrees, but 86 and 87 for Monday, Tuesday. Both of those days, a 30% chance of a late day shower or storm. We'll hold that into Wednesday, Thursday, and then bump it up to a 40% for Friday. Again, all next week, the highs are either 86 or 87, and lows in the upper 60s. Another factor, Gas Buddy says, is slowing.